This is our second study in this wonderful epistle. And we come this morning to the heart, the heart of this short missive. It is not only doctrinal, but it is also practical. It's short, but it is doctrinal, but also practical. So both aspects could be seen in this, in this wonderful letter. And as I said in our first study, this letter gives us the basic things a Christian should believe. I do not dare at all even recapitulate what we have said earlier. But as you could see, the apostle of love, because this is how we should look at John, squeezed as much as he can in his postcard or on his postcard. This is how you, you have to, to look at it. But remember, it is a heavenly postcard. It was not just what John wanted to put there. It was inspired. Through inspiration, he squeezed as much as he can on his postcard. Now, there is no doubt about the recipients of this letter. There is no doubt about it. Why? Because the elder, who is the elder, John himself, that's a name he gives to himself in verse 1, the elder is the apostle, he is the pastor, but he is also an old man. This is how we have to, to look at John in this specific time. So the apostle of love, the elder, the pastor, the old man is writing to the elect lady. And we believe that this letter was written to an individual. That's why we said it is put and it is classified among the general or Catholic or universal letters, starting from Hebrews until Jude, because they are not addressed to churches, but to individuals. So John is writing to the elect lady, which we can call Kyria, but he's writing also to her children. But it is interesting that the, the elect lady and her children, they have known the truth, they dwell in the truth, and the truth shall forever be with them. So that's how the, the elect lady and her children is presented unto us. And it is so, so important. So truth and love, or love and truth, should always be together. They are inseparable. There is no life without water. There is no love without the truth, and there is no truth without love. But we, we know, and I'm sure you don't need me to remind you this, we live in a world where truth is unceasingly and constantly contested by so many. What do we hear? This one has the truth, that one has the truth, this religion has the truth, the other one there. There are all sorts of truths in this world. And we are being blamed. You are intolerant because you say there is an absolute truth. But my answer to them, you are being intolerant also, the intolerance of intolerance, because you are telling us there is no absolute truth. Why we, why we believe, we see from the word of God that indeed there is only one truth. The Lord Jesus Christ said in John 14, verse 6, and we could spend the day really quoting so many verses. He said, I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. So there is an absolute truth. So truth and love must work together. We must cultivate truth. We must cultivate love. We must cultivate obedience to the truth to God 
but also to his word. Those are crucial matters. But also, as Christians, we must promote sound doctrine. <laughs> we must promote it. We must contend for it. Because this is so important. True love is a loyal commitment to the truth. True love is a loyal commitment to the truth. So when we come to Second John, it is, again, a short letter. I hope I'm just wet, wetting your appetite so that later you can, you can get interested and engage and back yourself in a deeper study. And God willing, as time goes, we will come also to Third John. Another Third John is actually the shortest letter in the whole Bible. So we, we look at this short letter. But it is so relevant and applicable. The whole Bible, if I could sum up the whole Bible in one sentence, Bible is a heavenly book, a divine book, to show us God's love, the person of God, who God is, what he has done for us, how to know him. But the Bible is not only about salvation, about redemption, about uh, fellowship with God. It is a book of warnings. The Bible is a book of warnings. Oh yes, it is a book of love. It is a book about redemption. It is a book about our sanctification. It is about a book about the great God and what he has done for us. But indeed, it is a book of warnings. And I will think, I do dare say, that the, every book of the Bible contains some warnings but if you doubt about it, I challenge you uh, in a friendly way, in a brotherly way, to study 2 Peter, 1 John, 2 John, 3 John, and Jude. Those five books are given expressly to us to warn us. And I could have... Uh, Put uh, uh, First Timothy, Second Timothy, Titus, the pastoral letters, Hebrews, and so on. But those five books, books are really relevant in terms of warnings to the people of God. But it is not just warning of, uh, in terms of being negative, because this is, again, what some people uh, will tell us. You are being negative. You are being narrow-minded. It's always about warnings, warnings. But you see, the warnings are coming from a heartfelt love, but also a heart that feels for the souls of other people. A nation without warnings will fall. A Christian who do not heed unto the warnings of the word of God, unto the warnings through the public ministry of the, the word of God, will fall into pieces. So, as we look at the second part of Second John, I would like to make four steps, just to help us really to dig a bit in, in the lapse of time we have before us this morning. The first one, there is a reason. The second, we have to look at the reality. There is a reality. The third step, there is a reward. <laughs> a reward for believers, for true believers. And the fourth one, the last one, there is a recommendation. We are given an exhortation. We are given a, a recommendation in the way to deal with false teachers. So let's look at the first step, which is about the reason. And look at verse, verse 7, please. Verse 7. There is that small conjunction there, but it is there. Some, some versions of the Bible miss it, but it's so important, that tiny word there, for which we could also translate because. <laughs> so there is a reason, and that reason is given to us to link or to connect what the writer has said previously, I could say in all the six first verses, but to concise it, to limit it, I, I will say this is a connection between verse 5 and 6 and what is coming onwards. So look at verse 5 and 6. And now I beseech thee, lady, 
not as though I wrote a new commandment unto thee, but that which we had from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk after his commandments, and this is the commandment, that as ye have heard from the beginning, ye should walk in it, because, that's the relation now, or for, because of the importance of walking in truth and love, and contend for truth and love, you need to do something. So there is a reason given unto us, and that reason gives us the importance of truth and love. My brothers and sisters, truth and love are the bastions. They are the bastions against false teachers and against false teaching and against error. So these are the bastions, these are the fortresses to protect us. Christians are to discern and discriminate. We are not speaking about racial discrimination, but we are speaking about spiritual discrimination. A Christian who has his hands open to everyone and anyone who claims to be a Christian is not exercising discernment and is not exercising discrimination. And we will explain more as time goes, but because you will see in the warning, we are given steps, we are given ways, we are given tools, we are given hints in order to know how to react or how to encounter and how to, to relate to false teachers and, and their, false, their false teaching. Oh, Again, I have to say, we are not being negative. Why? Because the apostle of love is telling us because there is something big, there is something crucial, there is something catastrophic false teachers are doing, so we need to heed, we need to be aware, and we need to protect ourselves against them. So that's the, the reason. The second, look at the reality now. There is a reality. And the reality in verse 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. But look what is said, first of all, what is said in verse 4. And then we will compare verse 4 and verse 7. This is frightening, at least when I read it, I was really frightened because... When you look at verse 4, verse 4, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children. Please let me, uh, uh, if I could, uh, I could retranslate or rephrase that verse by, by putting another word there, just, just for, for the sake of our, our understanding. Now, I rejoice, verse 4, I rejoiced greatly that I found some... So that's my replacement word. Some of thy children walking in truth. So in verse 4, some are walking in the truth. But verse 7 now, the comparison or the contrast is there. Is it some, just some deceivers? No. For many deceivers, not just some. So in terms of balance, <laughs> You can see with that, with the elect lady, just a few are walking in the truth. And I'm sure you will agree with me, we can apply it to today. If in John's times there were so many deceivers, what about today? So many deceivers. And the deceivers went out from the church. We will explain that as, as, as we, we look at it. Verse 7 again. For many deceivers have entered in the world. So, uh, in the, into the world. So we can see that there are many deceivers. And these deceive, uh, deceivers or false teachers, they are denying a very simple truth of the gospel. Christ is God. This is a part a part of the irreducible minimum of things to believe. 
if anyone, great theologian, erudite, consecrated, anointed man, if he doesn't believe that the Lord Jesus Christ is God, he is denying, actually that's my subject, a basic Christian doctrine. A basic Christian doctrine. Believing that Christ is God. That's basic. And no wonder in Luke 18 verse 8, the Lord Jesus said, When the Son of Man cometh, shall he find faith on earth? Many deceivers are denying the identity, the person, the work, the, the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I believe even a child, a child uh, uh, in Sunday school who have grasped and who have trusted in, 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 in what the Lord Jesus Christ has done wouldn't say, no, Jesus Christ is not God. But these great theologians, and uh, uh, John is speaking about them, they are denying what we may call a simple gospel truth. But the second thing, not only that there are many, look at verse 7 again. For many deceivers are entered into the world. If I may again retranslate this part, just, just because uh, it will help us, many deceivers have gone into the world. What does it mean? Where were the deceivers? They were in the church. Now, it doesn't say they were believers. They were deceivers while they were in the church. Seemingly, apparently, they behaved like uh, any, any true believer. But in fact, very soon, they went out from the church as missionaries. Let me call them. They are not missionaries, but mercenaries. That's the way we have to look at them. They went out. And you don't need me to tell you. You meet them in the street every day. They are here. But where were they before? They were in the churches. And the false teachers, actually we shouldn't go far. Please turn with me to 1 John chapter 2, because that gives us a, a, an idea of what John has said previously in 1 uh, John. 1 John chapter 2, and I promise I will not t uh, take you to any other verse. 1 uh, John chapter 2, verse 18 and 19. Little children, it is the last time. And as ye have heard, that Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would not doubt... They, they, they would not doubt have continued with us, but they went out that they may be made manifest that they were not all of us. So the false teachers were with us, but they left us. Why? <laughs> because from the beginning they were not of us. So John gave us that warning. And this warning about the coming of many false teachers is not something new. Oh, I wish I had, I have you the whole day. Just, just to show you from the scriptures, from the gospels so many times, Matthew 24, Mark 13, verse 5, verse 22, the Lord have told us that many false teachers, 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, many deceivers will enter into the world. Paul said the same in Acts chapter 20, when he was leaving the elders of the church of Ephesus, when he was, he was gathered with them, he said to them, I know, I'm putting it in my own words, I know, as soon as I leave, will come what? Many worlds will come, pernicious worlds, and they are so pernicious that they will ravage the church of the living God. And believe me, when you read Revelation chapter 2, the church of Ephesus, the wolves are already there. What happened to the church of Ephesus? The church left its first love. They left that first love. Why? Because the pernicious wolves were already there. And here, John, the apostle John, is just confirming to us what was already said by the Lord, 
by Paul in so many other scriptures. So you can see they were of us, but they went out of us. And Romans 16, verse 17 and 18 speaks about also the, the, the people who caused, they caused the divisions among, among the churches. And actually, it says that their God is their belly. They are not really proclaiming or, or they seem proclaiming the Lord or telling us that they have been sent by the Lord, but they have been sent just for their own care. So the world, this world is plagued with false teachers. The spiritual knows it all. Teachers are disseminating, propagating, spreading their teaching like cancer. This is how we have to look at them. But before I move forward, the, again in verse 7, there is an interesting word there. We shouldn't miss this. For many deceivers are entered into the world. The word deceivers there in plural is an interesting word. From this word in the Greek text, we have the word planets in plural, <laughs> planets. So the false teachers are compared to, to what? They are like wandering stars. They are like wandering planets. And believe me, they are actively leading people astray and they are pushing other people in to wander away from the truth with great conviction. And this is how we have to look at them. So with great conviction, they are uh, uh, leading other people astray. But of course, my brothers and sisters, I hope nobody thinks here that false teachers are walking in the streets with a label with, on them. <laughs> here I am, I'm a false teacher. Actually, they all look like the real McCoy. <laughs> they all look, look like the real thing. They all look like a sound teacher. But indeed, they are false teachers, they are imposters, they are wolves in sheep clothing and deceiving the, the naive and the weak. And as we look at them, they pretend to speak on behalf of God. But remember what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 11, that Satan himself is able to disguise himself as an angel of light. That's what the, the false teachers are doing to deceive many people in this world. Now we come to the, I hope it's practical, the pra practical part still in the reality, our second step in, uh, in, the, in these verses. And because of the seriousness of the matter and the problem, John gives us a solution. And the solution he gives us is made of three imperatives. Three imperatives in the text here. We will discover them as we, as we proceed. And the first one is in verse 8. Look to yourselves. So which means watch out. Or don't look at yourself. <laughs> That's, or don't mirror yourself. That's not the meaning. But watch out. Take heed and be careful. Be on constant guard. Know what you believe and why you believe it. Unfortunately, many Christians, they know what they believe, but they do not know why they believe it. <laughs> why do you believe what you believe? Oh, my pastor said it. Why do you believe in what you believe? My church believes so. No. We believe in these things because we have understood them and we know why. Because, not because we are stubborn, but because from Genesis to Revelation, this is what the word of God teaches. And if I could, uh, for the younger one, if I could uh, exhort them and encourage them, know what you believe and why you believe it. And to do that, you can just take the 1689 Confession of Faith, memorize it. <laughs> it won't do you any harm. Then you are on solid ground. You know what to believe. And we believe in these things not because the Reformation brought them, because forever from the Old Testament to the New Testament, this is what the Bible teaches. Reformation just rediscover <laughs> what was already there. So that's why we have to know what we believe and why we believe it. Please, complacency is a danger. My brothers and sisters, beware of novelties. 
I think they say in English, you can correct me about the proverb later, a new broom sweeps better. <laughs> so it's new, then it must be good. But remember the old adage, the old adage or the old saying says, if it is true, it is not new, and if it is new, it is not true. So when you hear some, some things no one has ever said, please be careful, watch out, watch out. Because the doctrine of God, no one will invent it again. It's already there, it's in the word of God. Do not be put off by criticism of being qualified, of being narrow-minded. We do not need new doctrine. But my brothers and sisters, we need only to grasp firmly what we already have. Understand it. Second Peter 3 verse 18, grow in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Psalm 119 verse 18, open mine eyes so that I can contemplate the wondrous things of thy word. This is the prayers which we must do when we come to study, to study the word of God. So, first of all, we must protect ourselves. Watch out. Know what you believe and why you believe it. But the second thing, in, in verse 7, but also in verse 8, he says that, especially in verse 7, for many deceivers are entered into the world who confess not that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh. This is a deceiver and uh, an antichrist. So the second thing, not only watch out, but the deceivers are qualified, they are antichrists, and this is not a matter of opinion or a, a side matters. No, 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 this is a very serious matter. Why? Because the false teachers are involved in a satanic campaign against God and against his church. What should we do? Watch out, reject them. And that's what you could see. Most false churches and most false teachers, they have their own policy, they have their own agenda, they have their own authority, they have their own version of the Bible, <laughs> and they even have their own private interpretation of the Bible. While in Second Peter chapter 1, it says no one can have a private interpretation of the Bible. No one. If it's only you who think so, you are in danger. But they are a clique, they have their own clique, and this is what they think, this is how they behave. But these false teachers, they are propagating uh, many heresies, and they are denying what I said earlier, an essential basic doctrine of the Christian faith, the divinity of the Lord Jesus Christ. But my brothers and sisters, Many of them, when you challenge them, is Christ the Son of God? Oh yes, he is the Son of God. But now, even though they nod their heads in yes, approving what you are saying, assenting in what, to what you are saying, when you look, you challenge them more, they will deny the authority of Christ, they will deny his miracles, they will deny his virgin birth. They will deny the authority and the infallibility of his statements. So that's why, don't be misled by the fact that they know the, their heads and they, oh yes, the Lord Jesus Christ is, a, is, a, is the son of God. Uh, this week, uh, just uh, uh, in, in the front of the church here, every day we have Jehovah Witnesses standing there, just passing, coming to the office, I, I will stop, the first question I always ask them, you believe Christ is the Son of God? Yes. Is he God? Mm. That is the problem. No. He is the Son of God? Yes, I believe. He's. Is he God? Is he the Savior? Yes, he is the Savior. Is he God? No. Oh, you are bringing Trinity. I said I didn't mention Trinity yet, but it's there. But do you believe that Christ is God? If he is not God, he cannot save. Because he is the Savior, he is the Lord, then he is God also. There is no lesser God. It's impossible. 
to have a lesser God. Either he is God or he is not God. He, is not, he cannot be a general angel or a great angel or an, arch, an archangel. Either he is God or he is not God. My brothers and sisters, there is no degrees in God. <laughs> he is God or he is not God. You cannot have God uh, uh, first class and God second class. God, the Lord Jesus Christ, is God. And now, that's something we can learn from 2 John. How, who is Christ in 2 John? And there are two hints which shows us that Christ is God in 2 John. And I will go back to verse 3. Verse 3. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Do you see the equivalence, the equality? Grace, mercy, and peace are given to us by whom? By the Father, and equally by whom? By the Son of God. So the Lord Jesus Christ is equal to the Father. He is God, and he is the Son of God of the same nature as the Father and the same essence. Truly God, the very God of the very God, not lesser God, but he is also a true man. That's what we have to confess, that the Lord Jesus Christ is a true man. So no incarnation, no salvation. And John 14, 6 again, no one can come to the Father except by the Lord Jesus Christ. So, no incarnation, no salvation. Christ, according to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, is the perfect image of God. And actually, the Greek word there is the word character. Just one word. Christ is the character, the print, the seal, the signature of God. Christ is the invisible God. And through him, he became the visible God. Who has seen him has seen God. And there is no way to have fellowship with God without the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's why John says here in verse 9, Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. So anyone who denies Christ, he has no God. Anyone who denies the divinity of Christ, he has no God. Can I give you a, a very important verse? When, to come back to my Jehovah Witness, when I said, please open your Bible to Hebrews chapter 1, verse 8. Oh, sorry, I don't have time now. We can discuss about it next time. But Hebrews 1, verse 8, God himself is calling his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, God. God is giving the title God to the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews 1 verse 8. So that's the key verse. Romans 9 verse 5. <laughs> there are so many texts where the Lord Jesus Christ. Thomas said, my God and my Lord. It was not an exclamation of surprise. It was a confession. <laughs> that's, the, that's the difference. So not to have the Lord Jesus Christ and not to believe in incarnation. The person put himself in an awkward position. So I have to move because my time is almost over. In verse 9, again, we see something important said there. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. The equality again. You cannot have one without the other. They all walk, walk together. And this is... a very explained to us in 1 John chapter 2, verse 23, to read later, because it's very clear there, if you do not believe in the Son, you do not believe in the Father. You do not have the Father, you do not have the, the Son, and vice versa. So in verse 9, the deceivers, to, uh, to again uh, explain the, the word transgressed there, whosoever transgressed, it's not the normal Greek word for transgression, but it means whosoever runs ahead or goes far ahead of the truth does not have God and does not abide in the doctrine. But you see, false teachers, they believe that they have advanced 
when you and me, we speak simply with, the, oh, you are a simple person, <laughs> they have advanced. And they are advanced. Why? Because they think they are the anointed ones. They think they are visionaries. And they know it all, and they know it better than everyone. But John says, whoever goes beyond the limit, whoever runs ahead beyond the truth, does not have God and is not related to the Lord Jesus Christ. They want, the, the false teachers, they want to reinvent and redefine the church. They want to redefine the doctrine. Look at the arguments they bring most of the time. Archaeology has discovered this and that. <laughs> or the old manuscript, with, suddenly a new, an old manuscript has been discovered. But even when those arguments are debunked, they still cleave. They are stubborn to what they believe. And they do not want to let it go. So with fair speech, they deceive the simple. They think they have something other people do not have. They are at the apex. They are at the top. But the apostle of love says, whosoever goes far does not abide in the doctrine of Christ. Please, before I come to the third step, the reward, again in verse 9, it says something which is, which is important. Whosoever transgresseth and abide not in the doctrine of Christ. What we believe was not taught by the church. It is the doctrine of possession. It is the doctrine of Christ. Christ taught that he is God. His apostles, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they taught that he is God. The doctrines of the apostles, they taught about it. But also, the church believed in it. You see the difference? It's not the doctrine of the church. The church believed in what Christ has taught and in what the apostles have taught. So we are recipients of what Christ and his apostles have taught. So we believe in that doctrine. My brothers and sisters, test the Christological view of false teachers. Test it. Watch out and test their teaching. Bible should be our guideline. Now, the third point, the reward. The reward, there is a reward. But again, remember, there is no amount of good works you can do in order to be rewarded by God. Salvation is of the Lord and by grace. But what does John says in verse 8? Verse 8, look to yourselves that we lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. There is a reward, but not just a reward, a full reward. My brothers and sisters, do not ruin and do not lose the fruit that costs sweat blood, time, energy. Do not lose what took centuries to be built. Our, our, our faith, what we believe is not an afterthought. It's not a man who just brought it. So that's why false teachers are wrong and we must watch about what they teach. We lose a lot spiritually in listening to the outlaws. They are outlaws. But as Christians, we lose a lot spiritually in listening to them. We are beneficiaries of a great inheritance. It's like a torch. We pass it on to the next generation. So we shouldn't spoil it, but the labor of every Christian will be rewarded. I have no time to take you into the verses, but Mark chapter 9, verse 41, Mark 10, 29, 30, Hebrews 11, verse 25, 26. All those verses are speaking about the reward of believers. No greater reward. I'm sure you are asking, will we have rewards in heaven? <laughs> but believe me, no one will walk in heaven with a crown looking at other people uh, uh, from the, the end of his nose. No. The reward is what? The full reward is to enter into the joy of our master. The full reward is to receive everlasting life. Now we are saved by hope, 
But when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, we will enter fully into that everlasting life. That's the reward. I know the Bible speaks about the crown of life, the crown of righteousness, the incorruptible crown. There are five crowns listed in the New Testament. But remember, in Isaiah, we are told that God himself is our reward. And in the book of Revelation, we are told that all those crowns, we will bring them and put them at the feet of the Lord Jesus Christ. He is the one who should wear the crown. And we worship him. So there will be a reward. A daily, faithful, dedicated, devoted life of a Christian will be rewarded. So don't lose heart, my brothers and sisters. Don't lose heart. No labor will be in vain. First Corinthians 15, verse 58. Our labor will be rewarded. Even the glass of water given in his name will be rewarded. In this life, but also the full reward, entering into the everlasting life. What is everlasting life? John 17 verse 3 says, Everlasting life is to know the true God and his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's the reward, and we are looking unto that. Now the last point, the recommendation. And I have to do this in two, three minutes, and there is a recommendation given to us in verse 10 and 11. If there come any unto you, any such person, this is the second imperative. Receive him not. Receive him not. Be hospitable, and the word hospitable, you know, there is a difference between xenophobia, which means hate of foreigners, and hospitality, the, word, the Greek word hospitality means to love foreigners. <laughs> so the word used here uh, in, in receiving, we, as Christians, we have to be hospitable. Hebrews 13 verse 2, we have to be hospitable. But please, you should close the door to deceivers. Watch out your company. We should not welcome their teaching into our homes. And now, I'm sure most of us here will say, we don't welcome any false teacher in our homes, but can I apply today? What about all the false teachers we watch on television? <laughs> I wouldn't dare name in all the channels, but you can see how much damage they are doing into the life of many homes through the television and internet. So we should not welcome their teaching no matter how nice and erudite they are, we should not endorse or propagate their teaching. Warn them with tact, wisdom, pray for them. Let the false teacher starve in his mission. Talk to him, but don't make him feel that he is a Christian. Don't make him feel that we believe the same thing. No, we are not the same. God forbid. He is a false teacher. And he must know that. But there is a caution. There is a caution. The text doesn't say, do not invite him for a cup of tea. <laughs> Actually, except the false teachers, which we know as false teachers, when a Jehovah Witness or a Mormon or they list all the, those cults who are knocking at our doors, when they come and knock at the door, please, <laughs> I will say, come in. <laughs> Come in, but uh, that's why I said you must know what you believe and why you believe it. Because they have been educated. They know how to answer the questions. And they have the answers already be being prepared. And First Peter chapter 3, verse 15 says, be ready. Be ready also. So let him in. But if I know he's a false teacher, he's the head of that uh, kingdom hall, he will never come in. And see the text. There is something, there is a hint there in verse 10 and 11. If there come any, any unto you, Galatians 1, 6, 8 says, even if an angel comes to you, and here I could, I could think the same idea is going on, and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, and the third imperative, neither bid him God's speed. But normally, my brothers and sisters, before you let somebody in, you greet him first, I hope. But the text here puts it the other way around, that the people 
are receiving false teachers, they welcome them in their house, and then they greet them later. But the idea, you stay there, I greet you there, I got to know who you are before I let you in. So that's the, the normal progression in our dealing with false teachers, no matter who they are. And we should not join them, we should not entertain them. And when they are leaving, you should not tell them, God bless you. I will want the opposite. <laughs> I will not tell them, rejoice. And actually the greeting there, do not uh, uh, receive him uh, not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. That, that expression is to ask him or to tell him, rejoice. May God be with you. And I think the word goodbye, goodbye originally means God bless you. <laughs> so each time you say to somebody God bless, uh, goodbye, you are telling him God bless you. No, I don't want to meet you again. I'm not wishing you God bless. <laughs> that's not my desire. So that's the command we are given here in the, in the word of God. And a lot could be said here. And in verse 11, before I close, for he that bideth him God's speed is partaker of his evil deeds. Elders, pastors, Christians who are entertaining false teachers, the word partaker here is actually the Greek word for fellowship. Whoever fellowship with him will take the consequences of his, the harm he does to the souls. False teachers are harming the souls of people. So do not welcome him and do not take the consequences of his evil doing. Trust, truth must be preserved at all cost. We can be gracious without compromise. We cannot associate with the enemies of God. I hope you will forgive me. Just one last point which is so important in this short letter. I hope I have whet your appetite to study it more, but look at the last words here in verse 12 and 13. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink, but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy may be full. The children of thy elect sister greet thee. Amen. And the apostle of love has much things to say and much things to write as usual. If you go back to his gospel, at the end he said, Christ did so many things, if I write them, the whole world cannot contain the books which could be written. So more than writing, he wanted to see Kyria face to face. And this is a Greek idiom, which actually means literally mouth to mouth. Or in other languages, we say eyes to eye. I would like to see you eyes to eye. Or in other languages, nose to nose, <laughs> to meet and speak with one another. My brothers and sisters, there is no greater joy than fellowshipping and seeing one another. Emails could do, phone calls could do, text messages could do, but nothing can replace that joy of seeing one another face to face. And this is what the Lord, how, how the Lord was speaking to Moses in Numbers chapter 12. More we know the truth, more we rejoice. More God gives us joy. joy. And one final analogy. I shouldn't miss this. There is a final analogy in this. As I look at the verse 12. Having many things to write unto you, I would not write with paper and ink but I trust to come unto you and speak face to face that our joy might be fulfilled. The Lord Jesus Christ didn't just write a letter to us. He came himself in his body. And in John 17, he said, before he left this earth, his joy, his desire is that one day we will be with him and 1 John chapter 3, verse 3 says, we will see him 
face to face, and we shall be like him. So that's, that's the greatest promise the Lord has given us. He came in a body like ours without our weaknesses. He came that our joy may be fulfilled. His desire is that for us to be with him. Christ is our Emmanuel, God with us. So love and live for the truth. May the Lord help us to be bold and to live for him. Amen.